Hello, ladies and gentlemen from around the world. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Global Talkative Series, a global platform where we come together to inspire one another, you know, collaborate, challenge one another. And it's an honor and a blessing for me and my team to have amazing guests from around the world, leaders, culture shapers, influencers, you know, coming on this show. You know, these are busy individuals and they've taken time to be on this show to join us and to learn, you know, from each other and then to share their wealth of experience with our audience all around the world. And today we have an amazing, powerful woman in the house. You know, from the post we sent out, uh, uh, it's someone that you need to listen to, to learn from and to understand. You know, it's a mentor, a motivational speaker and inspiration especially for women in this community and in our, around the world. So I'm going to bring her in on Instagram. And then, like we did on this show, I'll read her profile. So let me just bring our guest in from Instagram. I send the invitation to you on yeah, Instagram. It's not, it's not coming up this time. Okay, you're gonna see just uh it's gonna ask you to join something like that. Let me see it again. No, it's not doing it this time. Okay. Uh, this time Before around, I was asking, and it would just—I would just have to press yes, and it's not yes. doing it. This is uh, this one is uh, I because we're live. So the moment I am just gonna let me see. Deborah. Okay. Did you see? We're trying to get our guest on the Instagram live chat because we are broadcasting uh, both on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, real time. Yeah, uh, working. It worked the other times, it's not working this time. Okay, can you uh, try search for Lanry Ajayi on Instagram? Just uh, the arrow button. The arrow button will ask you to coming or to be you know uh to be part of the yeah so i'm looking at your feed right now okay yeah can you just uh type in something like uh say hi or just we'll just hold on we'll be live with you right away just trying to do just wave or something that will bring you in. <laughs> I don't see it. Okay, but you can see my live feed on Instagram. Um, I'm just gonna go back to you now. Okay. I, I don't see the live feed, I just see your site. Uh you can see me right on Instagram. I can see just your your actual your Instagram site. Okay. Let me just uh this is I don't know why it's not working now. It worked before. It's going to work. It's going to work. Okay. So I have live, watch live video. Yes. Yes. Click click on that. Yeah. Okay. Got you. I got you. Yeah. I see you. Okay. Yeah. So let me just. Uh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Oh, Thank oh, you oh, very oh, much. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> Yeah, good, good. Thank you for our audience. We appreciate those who are joining us. Uh, Prince Cretan, we thank you for joining. Uh, DN2 Kitchen, thank you for joining. So, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is by the name Deborah Ross, the president, CEO, and founder, Gamma Tech Inspection. And uh, our topic today is COVID 19, the impact on oil and gas 
industry. Sorry for the little each and glitch, you know, at the beginning. And uh, like we do it on this show, I'm just going to read a bio of our guest so that by the time we start with the questions, you can relate with us. So thank you for joining us on the Global Talkative Series. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm really thank excited to, to get this uh, conversation going. <laughs> thank you so much. So here comes the bio about Deborah Ross. A compassionate, strong, dedicated, with a doggedness for success. Highly competitive achiever. She's a brilliant first-class student from the get-go. A community builder, an engineering technologist, and a pilot. These are few words to describe Deborah Ross, the president, CEO, and founder of Gamma Tech Inspection Limited, an organization providing highly technical non-destructive testing, NDT, services for the oil and gas and construction industries. She's a mentor, personal coach, set booster, motivational speaker, movie and old TV show buff, self-confessed popcorn addict, and a good friend to hang out with. Deborah graduated at the top of her class in the aircraft maintenance engineering program at State Polytechnic. She became an active member of the Alberta Society of Engineering Technologists, Assets. She found a passion in non-destructive testing while earning a certification as an exposure device operator. Deborah is not a typical woman, but highly competitive growing up in a small town. To become the only single female owner of a company where women are not the status quo, a company uses technology such as radiography, ultrasonic testing, and ground penetrating radar to detect hidden damages, test product integrity, and ensure quality. A company garnering ringing endorsement and boost the list of 350 active clients at its peak, growing and adapting by the day. A woman who successfully entered into a male-dominated industry, she believed that there are more opportunities for women within the mark within and makes a point to the ongoing dedication of mentoring them in this regard. Deborah's story is that of a strong and dedicated woman who will not take no for an answer and with a continued determination for success. Gamma Tech Inspection Limited is living out its mission of striving for excellence and providing a wide selection of non-destructive testing services, a potential amalgamation and creation of a new company using a specific knowledge in our team and friendly computer's knowledge in UT is in the works. Never a dull moment. She has also taken on the challenge of Supremens where business partner to bring a new perspective to this 72 year running community icon of a company. Deborah is a big fan of Amelia Earth, the legendary American aviation pioneer and the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and always wanted to fly, which probably arose her interest in aircraft maintenance engineering at SAIT. She eventually got her own plane and really enjoyed flying. Deborah is a tireless community booster with a generosity of time and support for Calgary courses. She organizes a fundraiser for CIBC work and run for cure and is involved with Kids Care for Cancer, the Alberta Adolescent Recovery Center, STARS, and Business for Calgary's Kid Foundation, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and many others. She is one of the small group at the helm of new groundbreaking foundation called Top Eras, which will seek community helping community and more to be revealed in the later 2021. This is an amazing resume and a bio. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm very good. Wow, so it's kind of neat to um, hear your background. It's like a walk down memory lane, which is always fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite an achievement because uh, you know within the shortest period of time you've been living on on this planet called Earth. You've done so much, and you know I must say congratulations for you know doing this amazing work in this community and for the support and for the help and for the dedication you know it's an, your, your story is an inspiration for you know millions of women across the world you know we have a lot of folks who are watching us from around the world and who will watch this program you know when we are not even online and they will take something and they will take you know uh, an inspiration a lesson so let's start this conversation about the journey and life experience of you, you know, how will you describe your profound life? Uh, well, it's been an interesting go. I have to say that um, I certainly didn't go for the easy doors ever. I have no idea why. I think it's something to do with my um, competitive nature, uh, my need to succeed. I, I like challenges. I 
I don't typically take the easy road because I get bored very quickly. <laughs> Not of people, but you know, of activities. So I, I try to surround myself with the same uh, mindset. And uh, growing up in a very small town in BC, in upper BC, nowhere near Vancouver, which everybody seems to think all the time, uh, wow. the opportunities were, were very scarce. So I, you know, I lived out on a 12 acres and 15 miles to, to the school and um, very strict upbringing. And I'm grateful for that now. Not so much back then. Yeah. <laughs> really horrible back then. Um, but uh, yeah, so my, even when I was very young, so around the age of 14, I figured before the World Wide Web and, and all that, that I pretty much knew everything. Mm -hmm. And I would reach out on my own, leave home. Um, see what's out there. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> that mm. was mm. quite a journey. So I, I know lots of um, parents now with children around the age that I left home, and I look at them, and I can't, I can't even fathom these kids on mm. the street. And though you know it does happen, and when I say on the street, I don't mean you know in any kind of nefarious activities. I mean you just you know you sleep during the day when it's warm, and then you go out at night and stay up at night because you don't want to be sleeping at night. You never know what's going to happen. It's very dangerous. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I took a very unconventional road to get where I'm at and, you know, a, a few little fibs here and there to get a job. I remember I went down to Texas because I thought, oh, my goodness, I, why, you know, I need to get out of my comfort zone and where am I going to be the most uncomfortable? Well, I'll go down to Texas. I'm going to hitchhike or, you know, whatever I need to do and um, get a job as a secretary or, or something and surround myself with all these uh, preconceived notions of beautiful people. Because mm -hmm. I thought that was the thing. If you can make it with all the beautiful people around you and not feel all self-conscious, uh, you're you'd be good to go. So mm -hmm. that's sort of where I started. And you know, you you sort of I don't want to use the word BS, but it kind of was. You get your way into the door on based on your background that you had at 14 years old. If you can imagine, isn't a lot. I mean, yeah. let's think about that. Um, the Apple IIe was just coming out. Computers were just coming about. The basic programming was, you know, just at its onset. And here I was traveling around the world by myself as a female. Wow. It amazes me now to tell you this, that, um, you know, I didn't befall any kind of real danger because I, I was a pretty tough cookie or so I thought. <laughs> so that's how it started. And um, and then I found myself up in Edmonton. I worked for, I don't know if you remember this, Lon Ray, um, the Edmonton Trappers, which was a baseball team. Okay. Uh, in Edmonton and I worked there for a little while and it, just to show you again my little bit of my my personality Johnny, yeah um yeah I I did not want to be cleaning the toilets I did not want to be making the pizzas and whatever I was in the concession booth at the time I wanted to be the cashier so I basically horned my way in and shoved all the other people to the side so that doesn't really you know bode well for my personality at the time but you know a little overbearing probably but it was all about survival Wow. So um, survival for me, you know, I went up to Edmonton, um, wasn't a big fan of it only because I couldn't seem to connect with anybody. People were very in their little uh, cliques. Um, yeah. So in the 90s, I moved to Calgary uh, and I loved it. I loved mm. it then. I still love it. It's beautiful. You're close to the mountains. You're at a, a, a hub where you can fly anywhere in the world. It's amazing. And the people, I mean, the people are bar none. So mm. I've been here ever since. And um and then I started trying to, you know, once we got past the survival mode a little bit, I started thinking, now, what do I really want to do? What inspires me? What what uh, things, you know, make me click, make me want to open my eyes in the morning and go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier in the bio, uh, it was Amelia Earhart. So this was sort of the beginning of all. I mean, it's a huge step from when I was six, year old, six years old and tied feathers on my arms and jumped off a pig pen, flopping my wow. arms. I was going wow. <laughs> fly. I like to think I'm relatively intelligent, but at that age, you know, you have to experiment and you, you know, you have a few failures early on. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the first step, Lonry. I decided I wanted to get my pilot's license um, and I was single. Uh, you know, most of my life I've been very much so competitive that the, the you know, dating men was not really top priority at that time. And uh, I decided, OK, so I'm going to get my pilot's license. I started doing that out of Springbank. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, what am I going to do with a pilot's license? It's costing me money. <laughs> I'm not mm. I'm not making any money. I'm still in an industry where I'm not happy, administrative, you know, lower management uh, was very boring for me. So I thought, well, 
what if I'm going to be the Amelia Earhart of the bush pilot nature, and that's what I'm going to do. But what if my plane breaks down? How can I fix it? And I don't know how to do something simple. Mm. And hence, that's why I went to SAFE for a couple of years for aircraft maintenance engineering. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where it kind of all started. And then at the end of those years, I didn't have, you know, I'm living in a 400 square foot uh, basement suite um, and no money, taking pilot's lessons and paying for myself to go through state. Um, mm. Back then, it didn't seem too bad. Looking looking back on it now, I think, I don't know how I made it. There was a lot of craft dinner and, you know, fruit and vegetables, things you didn't need to cook, things that were very inexpensive. Um, so I went through there and I got into my last year, getting into the last three months or so. And I came across uh, some metallurgy and this non-destructive testing stuff. And one of the instructors actually offered to give us, you know, like a free course, or I think it was maybe it was 50 bucks, close enough. So I took that on the weekend for this uh, certified exposure device operator. And I wrote a government exam and I passed it. And then I found out very quickly, hmm, look at this industry. I'm very good at it, as dry as a popcorn, you know what, yet... I understand it. it, you know, I couldn't understand why other people were struggling with it. And I thought this could be something for me because in the aircraft industry, believe it or not, the people that are working on your planes are making not even a quarter of a salary as the people working on your car. Wow. So now think about that. <laughs> If, if a plane breaks down because you just had the guy that, that graduated at the lower end of the class working on the plane, you're dead if your car breaks down because the guy that graduated from the lower end of the class <laughs> worked on your your brakes or something yeah. most likely you're gonna pull over and call a tow truck yeah. so it makes no sense to me why the aircraft industry pays their mechanics and technicians so little so unless you're at the top of the of the very top mm. the living's pretty tough yeah so being wow. you know already in the world i i you know if you're in the aircraft industry flying a plane you need money <laughs> just yeah. like that kind of that kind of uh hobby so then i decided well okay how about this how about i go into the ndt industry that i'm very good at and support my habit of flying mm. wow. so that that's where it began um and wow. i could talk for probably hours and hours and hours on that um you wow. let me know you want me to stop and start laundering wow, that, that is an amazing story you know while you were talking you said something about uh, inspiration something that inspire you yeah. you know i want to really delve on that you know your life journey has been inspiring and blowing you know blowing what would you say has been your inspiration and motivation that has led you up to this point um, you know, so one of my biggest inspirations is it's actually not a woman, it's Richard Branson. Um, the, here's a guy that I was very aware of when he was back in his record store, barefoot, smoking marijuana and all that kind of stuff. Um, a very lovable kind of fella. I started reading his books and then, you know, he goes from one industry to the next and got into the aircraft industry. When he started Virgin, I would say at least half my friends had no idea who this guy was. Hmm. And he's such an inspiration to me because... He did it out of the love of what he's doing. He did it to to enhance everybody, the world, and, and, and everything he did to be the best of the best, like the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't get involved with all the negativities that uh, stardom or celebrity can mm. can give you. So I love this guy. So for me, I thought, okay, if this guy can do that, he can drop out of school and he can get all this done. Um, you know, much like Henry Ford, it wasn't that he was the genius, but he had all the people around him as the genius yeah. to, to take all the, that kind of pressure off of him. So that was a big inspiration for me. Um, and leaving home at a very young age, of course, um, some of the inspiration is necessity. Mm. So when you need to survive and, you know, you have a quarter in your pocket and you haven't eaten for a week, you do what mm. you do. You, yes. you, you know, like I may or may not have taken a bottle of peanut butter at one point and eaten that for a week because mm. <laughs> you know it's survival so there's yeah. a lot of you know unhappy stories around there but it all led me to where i'm at now mm. and um you know the motivation i think was just the constant need to to keep going and you, you know you know that you're intelligent you know that you can do this if someone would just give you the chance and you know to to enjoy some happiness in life and each little step, each little nugget along the way, whether it was negative or positive, led me to where I'm at today. And I, I think the biggest thing for me is I, I, I'm very, oh, very for the small guy, the little guy. 
Mm-hmm. So if I see a bully, for instance, picking on somebody, I don't think, I just act. I, I oh. see no reason for it. And it's, you know, even more prevalent in today's society. But so I want I want everything to be the best it can be for, for all those people around me, for myself and for anybody else. So it's sad to watch when I when I see somebody that's struggling, like for instance, this COVID, which has been just a, a devastating blow to, mm. well, to everybody globally. And it doesn't matter yeah. what industry you're in. That's, that's right. That's right. Now, you, I read in a, an article published sometimes about uh, so many discouragements that you met along the way when you start your organization. You went to a lot of banks. They turned you down. You yeah. know, oh. you did a lot. I want also, I want you to tell our audience how, you know, because uh, folks set up to do some things and then they meet a disappointment once or twice and they give up. Yeah, but you went around so many banks. Eventually, one listened to you. But what kept you going? And tell us that story. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that was tough. I mean, it was a real eye opener. I mean, there was a few things at foot there. Uh, the banking industry, at least back in two thousand and two, but I'm sure even before that, they have certain rules and regulations. And and basically, if you don't hit a certain revenue spot, they don't take you very seriously. So, and especially for me, I didn't have any business background. I had technical background, but no business. So when I go into them with my business plan that I, that I made up, cause that's the game that they make you play. Some of them didn't even call me back, Lonre. I mean, we're talking the big five banks without naming them, but I think we all know who that is. Yeah. And it was almost humiliating. And even, you know, I went to BDC, I tried AFSC and there was a lot of different nor- doors that I knocked on. And it was discouraging in the respect, um, not that they were saying no, but their lack of belief in me, Mm. myself, Mm. that was the toughest thing to swallow because it makes you think, it makes you think, okay, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I'm completely off my rocker. I should go back into the nine to five job and stop trying to branch out. But you know what, when I was in this industry for six years, what I seen over and over was, um, you know, a lot of substance abuse and that kind of thing. And there was about 10% of us that didn't fit that mold. So this is why I wanted to start the company to have the family boys that didn't want to go up to Fort McMurray for months on end or, you know, go out of town. They wanted to come home every night and make a decent living. So what I ended up doing is I did give up on the banks, uh, wow. H- or no, ATB, was the only one that gave me a fifteen thousand dollar credit line. I'll never forget it because wow. it was, you know, a lifeline. And I didn't use this credit line for probably two years because I didn't want to get into any kind of debt. I wanted to pay as I go, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And um, so what I ended up doing is those same big five banks. I had their credit cards. Made sure I had a credit card, all debt free. And I called them all up and said, you know, I need a raise in my limit, made up whatever excuses at the time. And um, within that one week, I spent all $150,000 to get the the first truck, the first darkroom, the first exposure device, um, hardness testers, the ultrasonic devices, all those devices that are um, around the non-destructive testing industry. And then I phoned them back and said, this is the catch. Hmm. Either you give me an interest rate that's reasonable or I'm going to default on all my payments immediately. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So I ended up getting between 0.3 and I think the highest was maybe 3.99% until they were all paid off. And it took me about two years because you're trying to survive and pay your own mortgage and all that. And um, that was a hard go, but I can't Mm. tell you how good that makes you feel when everybody's against you, you do it anyways. And these banks, the big five banks, it would not give me a loan or even the time of day in most cases, it was their credit cards. So they're, they're gonna end up paying for it anyways. So that's how it started. And um, yeah, that was that was really interesting. <laughs> that is, that is, you know, you, it takes someone with a very big heart and a very confident heart to do what you do, what you did. Because oh. some folks would be like, oh, what if the business failed? What's what mm-hmm. what if what if what you well, you're not even thinking about that, just you know, go for it. Go yeah, for it. No. And I wasn't Lon Ray. What I was thinking is I was mid 30s at the time. I don't exactly 2002, whatever that was. And um, I just thought, what's the worst that could happen? I go bankrupt. Yeah. So what? I'm early 30s. I go back to make $150,000 a year for somebody else. Not my first pick, but why not give it a try? And I really thought the hardest thing was going to be getting the clients. It actually wasn't because I had a really good reputation in the industry for my the work that I did. The hardest part um, of all things was 
getting and retaining staff that were going to be loyal to the company. Mm. Because if yeah. you can imagine putting yourself in their shoes, and here I am, this one person unit, or, you know, and I had a helper at the time, and I want you to come work for me. Are you not going to be a little nervous about that when you're coming from a multinational company? Of course you are. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so that was one of the biggest challenges. Hmm. And how did you manage to overcome them and to encourage and to keep your staff a lawyer and committed to working, you know, with you to oh, believe well, in you? I think I think many of them did believe in me, but um, I, how I managed to keep my core staff was to be fair. So, you know, I, I'm not about all about me. I want to give and receive in equality. And if they do the work, I don't want to micromanage anyone. Um, do your work and you get paid for it. I try to be fair as far as there's unions in our industry. So whatever the union was paying for that year, I try to give my guys that. Plus, you know, they, they need to get paid and respected for a different level, each person has a different level yeah. of knowledge and ability. So that's what I tried to do. And I, I think that worked quite well over the years, but the people that are only in the industry for money or, or any job, I mean, there's nothing you can do. So that mm. was a hard thing for me to learn as well, is that you can only go so far. And if people don't wanna you know, be there for any other reason than the money, it's probably not gonna work. That is, that is a very good example of leadership, you know, for you know, uh, making sure that your staff are well taken care of, paying them what yeah. is fair, which I think is lacking in our society now. You know, because oh, yeah. we have a lot of uh, of soul leaders who are trying to micromanage their staff, and uh, you know, because they are the owner of the business, they don't care if you go, I'll get someone else. But that yeah. is a very good example in which I hope a leader or someone at the hems of affair listening to us now will emulate. Thank you so much for that. Amazing. And that listen to the next question. You work in the different fields, oil and gas construction. Now, having worked in this environment and other sectors over the years as a woman, how will you describe your experience operating and thriving in a male-dominated industry? Oh, that's a twofold question for sure. Um, so if you look at it from the perspective of the client, it was fantastic because I'm very detailed oriented. I'm about getting the job done right. I read the code books. I make sure I understand what it is I'm looking at, you know, in the radiographic side of it. And, um, but from the perspective of your competition, whew, let me tell you, that was outrageous. You would not even believe the stories that I had to deal with, with uh, some of them trying to knock me out of the game, so to speak. Wow. <laughs> And, wow. and they did it for about five years, and it wasn't just them. It was the union. It was the regulatory agencies. I mean, anything that all the other companies were being told to do, I had to make sure I did things three times better. Wow. Now, you can just postulate as to why that may be. I have my own version of what I think that was. But, um, yeah, clients, I had no issues getting clients. That was super easy. Um, but the competition was a little harsh, and I'll tell you, you have to somehow learn to get a very thick skin without mm. becoming um, unempathetic. Does that mm. make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that so that, that was really tough. That is that is amazing. I want to say uh, this is still the Global Talk Addict Series. And our guest today on this show has been the amazing uh, Deborah Ross, the President, CEO and Founder of Gamma Tech Inspection Limited. And our topic of discussion today is COVID-19, the impact on oil and gas industry. And I appreciate those who are joining us. Uh, Pastor Emmanuel from Nigeria, thank you. Kerry Jukebox Hero, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. All of our family DJ from Lagos, Nigeria, thank you. Anna Oyele, thank you. Imole Ayashabun from Vancouver, thank you. Ama, Amara Stevens, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you for taking time to be on this show. Now, you know, the next question I have for you, Deborah, is, what have been what, what have been the key challenges you have experienced within and how did you overcome them you know talking mm -hmm. about this male industry you know i know it, there, there must be some challenges that you've experienced you know while you're working or your organization and how have you been able to overcome and stay afloat stay afloat during the covid um situation yeah oh my goodness you know what this is probably going to be very unpopular answer but um, because we are deemed as a necessary uh, industry, when COVID hit, we actually got very busy. 
because typically when you're dealing with radiation, we have to do a lot of our work in the nights, like after the buildings close down or, you know, like midnight and beyond. Yeah. Well, when all everybody stopped working in the downtown core, all the mechanical and electrical contractors started working earlier and all day long because they had access. And then yeah. we come in behind to make sure that they don't core through something. So we go and, you know, we x-ray a concrete slab and we make sure that the post tension cable or rebars or conduit are not in the way. So we got really busy, uh, wow. I'd say for the first two weeks and all of our crews are one or two man crews anyways. Mm. So I had a discussion with all my staff and said, you know, if you're comfortable working together, that's fine. You can take whatever protections we had, you know, the masks and, and the gloves and all that. Um, and all my guys went to work wow. uh, without, without any issue. And I, to my best of my knowledge, none of us received COVID. We had, um, one fella's wife that was working at a grocery store and somebody at that grocery store had gotten it and wow. they went for testing and then they came back and they were fine. So yeah, from, from the oil industry, from the inspection company, it was fantastic from the company that you're aware of. I'm involved with now Supreme menswear. It was devastating. I mean, these poor guys, honestly, they, um, uh, just imagine if you're, you're a high end store, you're any kind of retailer in this, type of a situation and you're told to close your doors and maybe you don't have an online presence even if you do hmm. can you imagine what these companies went through for two and a half months with no revenues whatsoever wow. yet they still owe the money to their vendors their suppliers yeah. um they still have to pay their leases i mean it's been a nightmare i mean thank goodness there was a little bit of government relief but you know think about that a little bit lon ray any government relief that was given, whether it's for wages or for business or this 40, 30 thing that they were giving to the companies. And yes, I took that too. Um, somewhere down the road, we all are going to pay for that. I yeah. find it very interesting that they found so much money in this kind of a crisis when prior to that, they didn't have any money for um, the senior citizens or, or other social programs or even much needed infrastructure. So that's that's an interesting sore spot for me, actually. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Now, the next question is very similar to that. How will you describe the impact of COVID-19 in the oil and gas industry? Spe specifically, um, yeah. So as a source of revenue, uh, the number one source of revenue in Alberta, uh, I, somewhere in the neighborhood of 27% 20, GDP, uh, it's been very destructive, very financially destructive. Um, lots of people have lost their jobs. They they can't go out and work. Um, I, I believe these in, these companies are going to have to redefine who they are and and why they're in it. Um, the investor skepticism is very high because we're you know we always have the pushback from the governments every time somebody comes in to invest in our province now there's so much red tape that it doesn't make it worth it for them. It's just it's not it's not reasonable for a company to come up here and invest their money and take five years to get anything even off the ground at three times the cost. So that's, mm -hmm. a, I mean, that's a different issue that the government's involved with, but there's supply and demand. So when your supply goes down for your oil and your gas and it drops 10%, you've seen it reflected uh, at the pumps. Yeah. Um, that has an effect worldwide. And it wasn't just the pandemic that you know hurt our province and and canada the saudi arabia and uh, russia had a yeah. big oil price war at the beginning of march well that knocked our price down 65 percent right there russia backed out and then opec and and its alliance basically fell apart so mm. there's more than one facet of uh, things happening and as far as the oil and gas industry uh for canada as a whole we're talking over a hundred billion dollars that industry brings into the country 530,000 yeah. jobs and, I, and i'm pulling numbers approximate so don't anybody yeah. look that up <laughs> oh, okay. See. um you know and i don't think so i i get a little um i guess put off by the people that are constantly trying to block like these illegal um uh, pipelines yeah for the pipelines they're trying to block and they're having illegal demonstrations and it's a big issue and it's so dangerous and we don't want it well really because i can tell you right now there's over six thousand products that need some kind of form of oiling and and gas to mm. to for you to have it and that's nail yeah. polish your phones hair dryer safety glasses crayons I mean, you name it, there's tons of stuff. And not only that, I don't know about you, Henri, but I haven't seen an electric flying aircraft yet. So yet. it's yet. unreasonable. 
to, to, to knock out the oil and gas industry. Never mind the monetary implications of that. It doesn't make sense. And I'm all for, you know, keeping our footprint, um, our carbon footprint low and come up with better technologies. There's nuclear power, um, you know, wind power, solar power, what have you. But we're not there yet. Yeah. So until and if that ever happens where it completely switches over, we're stuck with it. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. I mean, good on Elon Musk for all of his innovations and all the other people that uh, have the genius to come up with these things. But excuse me, but you're not going to get rid of the oil and gas industry anytime soon. Not so soon. Now, still talking about uh, oil and gas industry. You know, COVID-19 came like a mighty flood and caused a massive destruction in our world, you know restaurants hotels housing property oil and gas being impacted as you noted do you think the industry will be bouncing back you know as before and when in your own um, estimation okay so that's a you know that's a bit of a guess i'm i'm uh, i don't play the stock game and uh that's very subjective to <laughs> You know, depends what we're going to have next. If you look down in Texas now, they're all shutting down again. They're all in panic mode. So how that's going to affect everybody else, I don't know. I hope there's not a second wave. Um, I believe that the oil and gas industry will come back, um, you know, in the $50 per barrel kind of a thing, maybe by the end of 2020. Um, I, I don't really know. Um, I have read that the GDP is going to go up about 2.5% by the end of 2020. Which would be really good because that's more than the pre-pandemic yeah. um, numbers that we saw before that. So uh, I don't know. I, I think you know, government or the government needs to do more as far as um, staying. I, I guess giving back to the oil industry. Like if you look at Ottawa, for instance, we're always fighting east and west, east and west per capita we don't get anywhere near the equalization payments as the rest of the country, like Quebec does and whatnot. And I find that very frustrating. Mm. So mm. I do think we're going to bounce back. I just don't think it's going to be the way it was before. And people are going to be more conscious and we just need to move forward in the best, with the best information that we have in the best way possible. Mm, that is amazing. Now you were talking, you mentioned, you know, what the government could do. Now that leads me to the next question that, what do you think our government, you know, both federal or provincial or municipal and authorities need to do differently to save the industry as this is an industry that drives GDP, jobs and different aspects of provinces like Alberta? Uh, well, I mean, like I was saying in the prior question, um, the government still needs to be involved in, in some little bit. I know a lot of people would disagree with that, but they do subsidize um, transportation and storage facilities and then they regulate the prices. So that part of it's good, but their main focus is always, of course, environmental and lowering the carbon footprint in, you know, in wherever these activities are taking place. And that's fine. Now, excuse me, I need a water break. <laughs> okay, good, good, it's okay. But, um, most of the, I think we, like the big companies like Suncor and Syncrude and all those guys, they're already sort of self-regulating. And if anybody's coming up with ingenious new technologies to make the footprint less, it's those companies, not the government. So the government needs to step back and not make it so difficult for these guys to do their job. They can't be so unreasonable that it doesn't make sense financially or any other way for them to continue on. So government needs to step back a little bit, stop with the red tape, let these pipelines go through, do it in the most safe manner, which is what my company does. We go in, we make sure those welds are done properly. We do the integrity testing and, um, you know, get Alberta and Canada back on its feet and stop bastardizing the industry. I mean, we have to be able to get all, all of our oil to all these different refineries for you know easily so that yeah. we're not giving away our oil for nothing whereas everybody else in the world's charging way more than we are mm, mm. i think uh, i hope the government and those who are listening will take notes so that we can actually have maximum returns on the resources we you know benefiting now taking going away from oil and gas construction you know while i was reading your bio i read initially you you are passionate about community you know, especially with Kids Foundation, Cancer Foundation. Tell our audience, you know, more of the things you've been doing for the community. 
Well, you know, I, um, I'm not out there quite as much as I, I was before, but now I have picked a, you know, a few special um, community involvement projects that I want to be involved with because, again, um, the, the more comfortable that all your neighbours are, the more comfortable you are, everything can work um, simultaneously together and more, and more happy. So I try to be community involved, you know, even if it's on a small scale. I like to see organizations that collect money and help, you know, the kids, um, people in need, um, special needs, that kind of thing, and put the money back in the community. So I try to be involved with those people. So anybody that has um, a charity that goes out of country, how about we put our own mask on first? Yeah. And then we go and give what's left to everybody else. So this is why I am just recently involved with something called the Top Hatters Initiative, which was um, a dream uh, brought to surface by Darren Biederman, who owns Supreme Menswear. And it's a fantastic idea. Uh, and that is completely to keep the, you know, the money within the community. So you, it's a membership based, it's a foundation for profit. And 50% of that goes right back into the community with, you know, there will be an advisory board to decide where the money gets shared to what organizations, but it's a really sort of at the onset of, of uh, creation. And um, so I can't speak too much about it, but have a look at it online for sure. The top hatters, I think it's top hatters dash YYC or something. Yeah. It's but, sharing uh, the screen for our viewers. Yeah. Just to, sh to share as much as we can take as much uh, money that we can and give it back to the community. That's, that's all it really is. It's very simple. Um, I like to do that. I'm also involved with the kids cancer care foundation. We'll be doing the, um, another fundraiser here in September. Uh, Christine McIver is the head of that, and I'm proud that this will be my second year to raise some money for them. So basically, like I said, anything that can be done to make it fair and equitable for everybody um, using, uh, you know, corporate capitalism, I see no no issues in that whatsoever. That is amazing. Thank you so much. You mentioned something about Supreme Wear, Menswear. You yeah. know, I read it's uh, one of the, you know, almost over 70 years old uh, business in Calgary. Yes. So you are involved with them. Why did you decide to from oil and gas construction testing into <laughs> you know apparel clothing, especially men's clothing? <laughs> well, this is a story because um, what um, initiated this was I had met the owner of, um, of Supreme Menswear at a car event because, as you probably know, I'm a very big car fanatic, and yeah. uh, so I met this person and I thought, you know. I'm going to the F1 with my friend Kara coming up. Uh, this was last year, and I need something really funky, something that stands out, something really cool. And I met this guy, and I thought, oh, my God, this is perfect. I'm going to go down to Supreme Menswear, pick out a funky jacket, and have his master tailor make it into a woman's jacket. <laughs> so, wow. so that's what I did. So I went down there, and I had him make a couple of custom jackets. And let me tell you, he had to dig deep to do it because he only had 30 days. So it was quite an undertaking, wow. apparently. So, you know, that's kind of how it started. And I thought, okay, I love the top hat. I'm going to go down and wear that top hat down at the, you know, the Formula One in Austin every single day because I don't want to be the same as everybody else. I don't want to be a sheeple. I want to stand out. I want to have fun. I want to be goofy. Um, and not to say that, you know, I'm not mature enough to do my job, mm -hmm. but I, I'm very pliable as far as, you know, the, the fun factors go. And I did that. And then, um, then this pandemic hit. Um, and I'm friends with them, um, you know, Darren and um, the, his staff. And I just started seeing some things. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to volunteer my time. And I'm going to get this, the finances sorted and do what I can to help because Darren is a, you know, a creative genius, but he needs help. He can't do everything himself. Yeah. And when you're not bringing in any money, that's a tough one. So I went in and uh, I've been working on that and helping come up with ideas that moving forward are not going to be the same as before. So he's never stuck in that situation again. And um, so far, so good. It's been a very interesting challenge because I know nothing about retail unless I'm the purchaser and I go mm -hmm. in and buy something. So yeah, it's been it's been very neat. I, I've been loving it. That that is amazing. Now this question is kind of funny because uh, uh, actually Supreme Men's Wear was one of the malls or the shops that I bought things when I first came to this country oh, about that's five years ago. Your awesome clothes from my wonder. So <laughs> I sat down on the lion. There's a big oh, lion yes. there and some chairs. So. When I saw the website, oh, I said, okay, this is one of the first uh, uh, shops that I actually went to. I bought some things there. Yeah. Now, you said something that uh, you were going for Formula One and then you need a jacket to be made into a woman's clothes. <laughs> is there any plan? You know, because it's called Supreme Men's Wear. 
yeah. at what uh, is there any plan maybe you know in the making that uh, they'll probably make some line for women oh yes boom you hit it they had it years ago i'm not sure what um why that stopped but yeah that's in the works and uh you know maybe it'll be supreme fashions instead of supreme's menswear i i don't know but yeah, yeah that's in the works we want to bring in some very hip cool jeans i know for me it's one of the hardest pieces of clothing i can buy because they never fit properly because i don't know i don't know who creates these things but we're not all built like sticks <laughs> Mm -hmm. And anyway, so he's going to bring that that in and some different lines for the women. Uh, we're hoping to have that done maybe September, October this year and uh, see where it goes. And I'm very excited about that. I know um, one of the ladies that works there, Amra, she is all over that. She's excited. In the meantime, I'll keep having their master tailor make my, my special jackets for me. And um, I love it. I'm proud. And this stuff lasts. Let me tell you. I've seen mm. some shirts that have been around for 20 plus years and wow. maybe the cuffs wear a little on the edge. You can replace the cuffs and the material is just beautiful. So mm. yeah, it's something it's basically to me when I walk in that store with the lions and the, you know, the ambiance and the music and the energy, it's like the apple of New York and we have it in Calgary. So let's support. That's all I have to say. That is, that is amazing. You to support local, you know, especially yeah. organizations that have, you know, you know, uh, been existing for many, many years, you know, and still, you know, yeah. I'm sure generations of Calgarians have, you know, come and gone and the, con the organization is still existing. That is amazing. Now, you know, while going through your, you know, uh, bio, there's something that I read that got my attention, you know, apart from being a mentor or a personal coach or a set booster or a motivational speaker, there's something that's, you know, got to me, <laughs> movie and old TV both self-confessed <laughs> popcorn addict <laughs> tell our audience what has got to do because i remember you know to our audience my first uh i met uh deborah on the movie set oh the was, Westgate commercial Westgate yeah. commercial so <laughs> that was and i must say that you're very humbled you know where i come from in my country if you see a successful man or a woman a businesswoman because it's i don't know whether it's a thing Folks who have money or who are rich or wealthy, they want to show that yes, I am this, I am this. Uh, but I learned a lesson, you know, some good lesson that day. You know, I've not met you before, but I've learned one thing: to respect everybody, irrespective of how you look or how you yeah. say or what you say, because you never know what you, the person has got inside. Yeah. It's not about what you have. You know, our life is not about what we have, but about the substance and the contents we have in our hearts, and that makes our life beautiful. So we met that day, you know, just to our audience to see. So what has, tell us something, the story about the movie and the popcorn addict. <laughs> You know what? I, I've always been swept up in the fantasy world. I mean, in all genres. Okay, not horror. I'm not really a big horror fan, but some of them are funny. Um, anyways, I've always loved the movies and the popcorn. I mean, you can't go to a movie without a popcorn, which makes dieting almost impossible. Uh, so that's one of the things that's missing right now during this pandemic that I thought, my God, I had no idea how much I miss just going to the movies, having a popcorn, you know, having a drink with a friend and that kind of thing. And um, I just love it. I, I, you know, I don't even have TV. I have Netflix because there's documentaries, there's the movies. I love them. I, and, you know, um, as I got a little more um, ease with myself, which is why you saw me on the WestJet commercial, I thought, why not? Is there a is there, um, you know, any kind of gender stopping me? Is there kind of an age group stopping me? No, it's one thing in the movie industry. You can be all ages, shapes, sizes, colors, doesn't matter. You can have, you can be doing that for the rest of your life, whether it's just the background or you get a speaking role. Um, I've had some amazing experiences. Um, as a matter of fact, it was one of the reasons that I went on the uh, Calgary International Film Festival as a board member for a few years. Um, it was just an amazing thing to be part of, and uh, boy, the work that that those guys uh, put in to to make it what it is every year is really something to behold. So, um, yeah, popcorn fanatic. What can I say? I'm still a popcorn fanatic, and uh, I don't think that'll ever change. Yeah, everybody loves popcorn. That's amazing. Now, let's talk briefly about Gamma Tech. We mm -hmm. have about like uh, ten minutes more. Mm -hmm. Now, you said something about uh, something in terms of like a you know. Uh, uh, collision or uh, um, I'm just finding a word to kind of uh, maybe a merger or something with some other company or something, you know. Oh, what, what, yes, yeah, about the organizations, you know, trying to have a you know international link somewhere. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so I mean, I had uh, Gamma Tech Inspection running for 18 years now, uh, and a friend of mine who is a competitor, one of the good ones, <laughs> he's been around for, oh, I don't know, I, I, I really can't say, but over 20 years for sure. And he's really, really the authority on the ultrasonic side, which is one of the main five disciplines. I'm really the authority on the radioactive side. And why we didn't do this before, I don't know, but we thought, wouldn't that be something if we, we, we thought about merging and we thought, ah, oh, that's too complicated. Why don't we just start a third company together and, you know, build something really fantastic with both of our knowledge base and see where it takes us. And I, I'm really looking forward to this. I, again, you know, when you're, when you're in your own company and that's all you're doing, you think from ego, you think, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to. I don't want to have any partners and I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. And then you have to get past the trust factor. And I've known this guy for many years. He's fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's time to set that afloat and we're looking forward to it. I have um, actually one of the guys at Supreme that's doing their social media is helping us out with, you know, what are we going to call this new company? What's the logo going to look like? What are we going to do? It will be very fast and furious once that starts. And I'm hoping to have that done for sure by the end of the year. That is amazing. Still on the Global Talkative Series to all our audience from around the world. Our guest today has been the amazing Deborah Ross, the President, CEO and Founder of Gamma Tech Inspection. And our discussion today is COVID-19, the impact on oil and gas industry. Now, you know, uh, I have this question, you know, what critical steps or disposition do we need to have as we live in what we now know as the new normal? As the world changes, you know, how, how do you, what, what kind of words do you want to you know, tell our audience? We have this new normal lifestyle. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to say for everybody because, you know, you, you heard me say that Gamma Tech flourished through it while, while so many others, you know, went bankrupt or their restaurants closed and they're experiencing so much hardships, you know, and family members with the kids you know, at home instead of at school, I can't, I can't even imagine. But I think if you, we want to take any good out of this, it is a perfect time to reset, reset your mm. thinking, reset your thoughts of, you know, community and friends and connection. And, you know, I think we've gotten so wrapped up in all the technology that we're losing touch with each other. And this mm. literally forced us to disconnect from everyone and it's the yeah. most it's the worst thing that could ever happen to any individual we are not here on this earth to be by ourselves we're not supposed to be isolated we need the connection uh, we need the the love of our family and friends so i think keep it simple you know look more look forward at, at the things that are going to be valuable to you you have to be able to shift your mindset and um you know be creative and what the new you is going to be. Be creative and what the new company is going to be. And don't repeat past mistakes because I think this caught everybody right off guard, like, you know, a big hit on the head with a yeah. rock. I mean, no one saw this coming and it's unfortunate and we don't know if it's going to happen again. So, um, yeah, you adapt to the new to the new normal. And, you know, excellence is not an act. It's, it's um, a habit. So yeah. it's consistent and, you know, in your execution, work hard and have empathy for your fellow person. If they're having a bad day and they might snip at you, you know, mm -hmm. just understand you don't know where that's coming from. It's not you probably, it's something yeah. that's happening to them and have empathy for them. And, you know, there's gonna be two sides of the COVID and you've probably seen this Lon Ray where there's people that are so fearful, they're driving with masks in their car and then you have other people that are not fearful at all. Yeah. So I think for those people that are, you know, not concerned about it, just be respectful. Of those that are and, and do your best to you know smile at people did you notice that when this all started that people stopped smiling at each other at the grocery yes. store? it's like well, they, yeah they thought if they look at you they're going to get covid well <laughs> you know obviously there's an issue and there there was a reason to be um you know on afraid. lockdown mm -hmm. but i think perhaps the one paintbrush for the whole world lockdown was not the way to handle that it you know it's understandable in New York and Japan with the kind of populace that they have, that they have to be a little more stringent than somewhere in Canada that we're so spread out. Um, yeah. But you still have to be respectful of it. That is amazing. Now, as, as an amazing, successful woman in this industry, there are a lot of uh, uh, women who are like, who want to be an entrepreneur. They want to step into this business. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some have their regular nine to five job, 
some are not you know gainfully employed and some are passionate about business i have uh friends who are like you know i want to start this business i don't know what what of advice do you have for women who want to take that bold step but they're still afraid of the unknown that am i going to be successful or not because working nine to five is sort of like okay secure in a mm -hmm. way that okay at least at the end of the month something is coming in but if i'm going to stop my job to start my business what word of advice? How how can you encourage women out there? Well, the best advice I can give is you need to get past your own fears. So you need to look at the worst case scenario starting your company. If you can live with whatever that worst case scenario is, then there's no reason to stop you from doing it. And don't listen to your family and friends that are all telling you don't do mm -hmm. it, you're crazy, whatever. Um, you need to listen to your own gut because you're the one that's going to have to live with the decisions that you make, whatever repercussions that is, either good or bad. Um, I would suggest, you know, if there's a specific industry that you want to be in and it's concerning, then find a mentor, uh, find a company that's similar and done that, see what they've done to be successful and, and try to follow something similar until you find your own niche and your own special nugget that makes you stand out from who they are. Um, and work hard, don't give up. I mean, so many people get to that one yard line and they, they don't see the you know, the other side of the mountain, unfortunately, and they stop when they were so close to the success, they didn't even realize. So it makes me think of that, you know, that meme that you see all the time with the big part of the mountain underneath the water and the little dinky peak sticking out. That's pretty much it. You know, mm. it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, rarely. I mean, there's always yeah. an exception. Somebody, you know, gets lucky. Um, but work hard. Be genuine. Be genuine. Mm. Everybody loves that. Nobody likes a BS. Or if you don't know something, just say it, yeah. you know, and, and uh, be straightforward. If you don't know it, learn it. You know, I mean, I had no business background whatsoever. I learned as I went. I learned how the, you know, the payroll taxes work, the corporate taxes, the Alberta taxes. You know, I had to learn everything from scratch. It's doable, but you have mm. to put the effort in. So if you're going to start it, you got to be in it for the long haul. Mm. Learn it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Some yeah. genuine. Those are very, very powerful words. Uh, before we round up, the last question I have is, when are you flying again? When am I flying again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel so sad, you know, that I, um, so this is sort of ironic. I, I put all that time in to get the license and, you know, I flew, I bought the plane. Um, I picked it up from Selkirk, Manitoba, flew it back here. And then I didn't, I had the money to fly it, but I didn't feel like I had the time to fly it. Wow. Because once you get your license, Lonre, you have to keep flying or you, it's not that you forget. It's that you don't know what the new regulations are. You don't know, you don't remember the call signs. I mean, I still know the phonetic alphabet, it's still in there for some reason, but you, it's regulatory that you have to fly so much times a month. And then if you have a plane, you have to have that insured for a million dollars a seat. And wow. it happened to be a six seater, which is almost hilarious because the last two seats are right on the floor. It's kind of like luggage seats. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a very expensive hobby to get into. Um, I would love to fly again. I initially was thinking to do helicopter pilot license, but um, that was pretty expensive. Even back then, I think it was something like $350 an hour. So it's a little wow. bit of a rich, rich man's sport. Or a very more than, the, more than the plane. Helicopter is more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Fixed wing is much cheaper. I think at the time it was 100 110 an hour, depending on you know what size of Cessna you were in, a 172 or a smaller one. So uh, I hope that someday I will come back to that. Right now I have a lot of other things on the go, and and I'm happy with that. So as life carries on, you know what? Your, what are, is important to you changes a little bit, and I'm okay with that. Oh, that is amazing. You know, this is, this is a very, very, you know, uh, important uh, discussion today, and I appreciate, you know, all our guests from around the world joining this conversation you know thank you so much for taking time to be part of today's discussion and especially to you uh deborah you know for sharing your minds for giving us this uh information the journey the process the discouragement the challenges and then the tenacity to continue thank you so much i, I believe uh you've spoken to a lot of individuals including me and a lot of women around the world that you know what uh it's not about how you start. It is not about your background, where you're coming from. You know, you said that from a small town in BC. But you know what? It doesn't matter the small town. <laughs> now, you have put a light. You know, each time I'm sure a lot of folks from town will be so proud that, oh, look at that Deborah, the <laughs> young girl from that house. Look at what she's doing now. And that's a story that, you know, you know that, that, I, that I love to tell, you know, that it doesn't matter where you're coming from. 
but what you where you're going and what you're doing with your time is what matters and how you're impacting the community the lives of the people you know mention about how you work with your staff you know having them in mind and then you know, connecting thank you so much for all the good works you're doing thank you thank you so much appreciate your time and our audience Thank you so much for staying with us today on the Global Talkative Series. It's been an awesome time talking to Deborah. Do you have a final word for our audience? Oh, no. I, I think, you know what? Just keep on living. Don't let anyone tell you to stop living. Don't let anyone tell you to stop hugging your family and loving everyone around you. you just keep strong and, and do, what, do what feels good to you because you know what the answer is. You already know. Thank, Thank you very you much, so much. Thank you so much. We'll see you again. Thank you so okay. much. Bye for now. Bye.